Hey guys, what is up? My name is Eric Farewell from Aviator Perimotor, and I'm joined today by my business partner, Travis Burns. And we're truly honored to have you guys here at our facility in Central Florida. This video has been a long time in the making, and it's something that we're truly passionate about, and we hope that you'll come along on this journey with us as safely as you possibly can, uh, because we're here to do something different today. Uh, we are. Uh, our, our goal at Aviator and our mission is always to inspire people to live life, to, to live adventure, and to kind of get outside the box. And one of the things that we're trying to do with that is uh, create a video. A, a very that is going intense to, video. A very intense video that is going to give you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to get into ground handling and kiting a glider. Now, this is actually happening because we have discovered a need in our company. Basically, if you were to call right now, and we're actually filming this in May of 2017, if you were to call right now and say, hey, we want to come learn to fly. This, we're passionate about this. We've seen your videos. We want to get into this paramotor thing. We would have to tell you that if you wanted to train right here at our facility in Lake Wales, you'd have to wait until next summer at the earliest. And that's kind of a big bottleneck, and it's, yeah. it's upset some people. It know? has, it has, unfortunately. And, and I think we're not the only paramotor business in that situation. Um, yeah. The sport has really seen an explosion, especially over the last six months. And I think there's a lot of reasons why that's reached critical mass. But awesome. really, no matter where you go, there's a lot of folks out there that do this professionally that are months and months behind yeah. on being able to get students into a training program or slot. Indeed. And so our first thing that we did was we created what we call the Alliance Program. And the Alliance Program was designed to take existing schools, dealers of ours, that were already teaching. They're all USPPA certified, or the majority of them are. They're all very experienced instructors, but they wanted to kind of take their school to the next level. So they came here and they learned how we taught, what our syllabus was, what our, how our PowerPoints look, uh, what progression we use, because our school is a little bit different. I mean, we have a, a really step-by-step -step approach. Right. And, and it's working really well. So these schools came to us, they joined the Alliance, where basically they teach our syllabus, they use our equipment, they have our same methodologies and our, our values, you know, where they, they're really hopefully sharing with their customers the same things we do. Right. Well, that, well, that's the idea, and that's why we've gone ahead and we've tried to create a program that, for these people that are waiting for now, uh, maybe up to 18 months to get into one of our training programs. So crazy. I apologize. That are really excited <laughs> to get started and, and to get into the sport and, and to be able to do something before they come and train. Yeah. We've tried to create this project so that people have something that they can take and do at home and actually get started and get excited about the sport. Yeah, so as you guys are watching this, and I'm sure you've seen all the marketing stuff behind it, but you know, this is not a replacement for training, but this is a great no. first step that you can take before you come to us or to one of our Alliance partners or any other USPPA certified school that's out there. We hope that you'll utilize this as something that will help you along your way, not as the end all solution. So, not at all. Uh, with that said, I do, I do have to dive in and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break the, the, the rules here. Please, I beg of you, think of this not as simply instruction that is going to get you through everything you need to know before you start flying. Because while paramotoring is super fun and amazing, it's a great adventure sport, it can kill you. And mm -hmm. what you'll learn from an instructor will blow your mind. There's so much behind this that we can't educate you through a video. This whole purpose here is to teach you how to kite the glider, to become one with your wing, and to help make your training experience simpler and faster. It's not meant as a replacement for instruction. Not at all. At all. It's just meant as a way that you can start doing stuff right now that will prepare you for next summer or next month or whenever you come to train with us or with one of our Alliance partners. Make sense? Perfect sense. Okay, so yes. uh, with that said, I want to just walk you guys through briefly what our plans are for the week or for the, the few hours that we have with you here uh, at Aviator. We're going to take some time to walk you through both the glider and the harness, what it looks like, what it feels like, how to clip in, how to keep yourself safe. One of our instructors, John, will take you, take you through that whole process. We're going to walk you through field selection, what you should be looking for when you're going out to a field to kite. Not only that, we're going to talk about weather selection, why it's so important and imperative to make sure that you're selecting weather safely, just as you will when you're flying, because just like flying paramotors, kiting can kill can you kill too. you. Yeah. Absolutely. We're not trying to be negative. We want to make sure that we were very clear with you guys though, because this sport is incredible, but things happen very quickly. And particularly as a beginner, you have to make sure your field selection and your weather selection are incredibly precise to keep you safe on your journey. Mm -hmm. So uh, after that, we're going to go out to the field. We'll work on reverse kiting, forward kiting. Uh, let's see what else we're going to go uh, We'll talk about how to disable a glider in high winds. High wind we'll, disables. We'll yep. talk about how to, we'll put some cones out there. We'll talk about how to control the glider, put it in any direction that you want to go so that you're in charge of that glider, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Which at first it, it will feel Maybe. that it's uh, a little different that way. We're going to talk a lot about frustration because that is 100% normal. There's going to be a lot of frustration, guys. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're going to go out there on day one and you're going to watch these videos and you're going to try and figure out your left and your right and you're not going to know which one is which. 
and that is normal. Our students normally, even into day two, things Sometimes don't click. Into del often into day three, yeah. things don't click, and it's very, very frustrating. You have to. You have, we want you to know that ahead of time, Absolutely. because it's very important. Everybody struggles with this. People don't become experts in one or two days, or overnight, or in a week, or a month. Yeah. Um, even at this point, as pilots who have flown for years and years and years. We still strongly believe that you should be spending at least a half an hour for every hour that you spend flying kiting the glider. It's fun. It makes you better. It, it is fun, better. and we have a blast. It, it really is truly fun. It's great exercise, and it will make you a better pilot, and it will reduce your frustration. Well, I think that's one of the things that we really hope for with this video series is that we want your understanding of the entire sport to be dialed in for safety, but we also want you to understand that this can be fun. Now, one of the misnomers with the YouTube phenomenon that is uh, paramotoring is that it looks really, really easy. And as Travis was just saying, it's not. So we're gonna do our best to systemize things to keep it you safe and to help it become easy, but it's still gonna be a challenge. And we need to make mm. sure that we have an agreement right now between us and you, that you understand that you're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be struggling, you're gonna be tired, and you're still gonna come back and you're gonna use this video as a step-by-step -step guide to remind you not to be too frustrated. And if you get to the point where you're just too frustrated, you're making bad decisions, take a break for the day and mm -hmm. come back to it. Absolutely. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about safety and about uh, mindset, about check, clearing up that checklist in your mind, making sure that you're ready to inflate the glider. But uh, this is a good first start, I think, to kind of help you understand that it's gonna be a process. Yes. So uh, with that said, I think that I'm done. You set? I'm good. All right, so we're gonna take you guys over to John Isley, one of our instructors here at Aviator, who's gonna walk you through all the little things you need to know about how a glider works, how a harness works, what it looks like, what it feels like, and what makes it work piece by piece. Great. Cool. Now in this first class, we're gonna be talking about a few basic things that we can keep using throughout this course. Now if at any point you start to become confused or maybe you missed some information, feel free to follow along at home in your student outlines and also feel free to use the back button in reverse and maybe go back to make sure you don't miss anything. Now we're gonna talk about a few things, starting with the paraglider itself. We're gonna talk about its anatomy. We're gonna talk about basically how it's constructed. We're gonna talk about how it all fits together. We're gonna to talk about the harness. We're gonna talk about how to put everything on. And we're gonna talk about how to clip ourselves into the wing, also known as a glider. We're also gonna talk about the fundamentals of a launch, whether it's a reverse or a forward inflation. They all have some basic fundamentals in common with each other. All right. Now first, we're gonna talk about the basic anatomy of the paraglider itself. Now a paraglider is essentially a flexible airfoil that generates lift under which the pilot is suspended. And he's suspended from this paraglider through risers and these suspension lines that you see right here. These suspension lines each correspond to unique places on the wing and have a specific purpose. Now, as, as these suspension lines are tensioned, they'll begin to form that wing's characteristic elliptical and aerodynamic shape, which generates the force that we know as lift. Now, these glider lines all have an outer core that has a nylon sheath around this inner Kevlar core. Now, this inner Kevlar core provides structural integrity and rigidity to the lines. It's basically what suspends all of our weight. This outer nylon core is mainly for the purposes of protecting the inner Kevlar core. Now these glider lines are all connected to the risers with their specific malleons. You also might see these on a riser system with uh, what we call soft links, which are basically little Kevlar uh, cords that bind everything together. Now starting from the end of the uh, riser, you can see on this riser that we have a leading edge right here on top, and we have a trailing edge on the riser right here. Now if we were to look at this glider in flight, with our wing moving this way, you can see that we have the A's right here, the next set of risers right here is known, are known as the B's, the next set of risers are known as the C's, and the next set of risers are known as the D's. We can also see this on this board. We're gonna imagine that this riser system is moving this way in its flight path. 
right here, you can see the A's right here. This is what's known as a split A system with the front A's right there going to the centermost portion of the leading edge of the wing. This second line of A's is what we call the rear A's and that goes to the outermost portion of the wing. Now this next riser is called the B riser. That is the next line of, uh, of lines that go down on the wing. We then have the C riser right there, the D riser right here, and then we have our brake line. Now we'll see that this brake line goes through a pulley to its brake handle or toggle right there. And we can also see that there's a little magnet right here. If you ever hear us say ozone to ozone, we're talking about stowing those magnets on the brakes. And we want our brakes to either be in our hands or stowed on the magnet. On the ground, we don't want to release the brakes because they can fall through the lines and then we'd have to untangle them. In the air, we don't want to let go of those brakes because they can potentially go through our safety net on the motor and go into our propeller. So we want to build a good habit of always stowing those brake toggles on the magnets or the clips if, you, if your risers have a clip system. So as we go down this riser right here, you can see that we have a trim system right there. We have this little loop that slides up and down a trim buckle. We also have what we call a speed system right here. Now with this speed system, that allows us to basically push forward on a speed bar, pulling this leading edge down into flight. So we'll talk about that a lot more during our class on wing design. For right now, we could ignore it. We just want you to know that it's there and what it is. So we see that speed system on the leading edge of the riser right there. And then we see this trimmer on the trailing edge of the riser right here. Now, basically, as we pull this trimmer down, we're taking that trailing edge of the wing and pulling it in like so. As we release these trims, we're essentially pulling that trailing edge and allowing it to come up. If we go past this little white line that you see right there, which is about halfway on the trim setting for this, uh, for this specific riser, we come all the way out. We're essentially bringing that trailing edge of the wing up. For right now, for the purposes of our class, we're just gonna keep that trimmer right in the middle, right there. So you can see our risers in our hands right here. And if you look at the riser, you can see the speed system on the leading edge and the trimmers on the trailing edge of those risers. We can remove these risers from each other, just like so, and see how it's laid out just like that. So we're gonna take these trims, we're gonna bring them down to about halfway right there. That's the recommended takeoff setting for this wing. Pull this other one down right there. And we can see that these lines go all the way up to the wing. Now we're just gonna hit the I believe button right now and imagine that we're out in a field and I can lay out this glider and inspect all of the lines. But if I were able to do that, you'd be able to see that these lines go up and cascade. They basically split off and branch off to their own corresponding places on the wing. Now you'll see here that we have inner cells and these inner cells fill with what we call relative wind or ram air. Relative wind is the the wind that is coming towards our wing that is directly opposite of its flight path. So that relative wind or that ram air will go inside of these cells and pressurize the inside of the wing, allowing the glider to take its characteristic aerodynamic shape and generate what we know as lift. You'll see here that inside of the wing, there are these little holes inside of our wing ribs, which are called baffles. And these baffles allow that pressure going into the wing to feed high pressure inside of the wing to a low pressure area of the wing. You'll also see here that we have these things called battens. And they're basically little plastic wing ribs that go along the leading edge of this wing and provide structural rigidity to this wing and allow it to inflate a lot easier and a lot more uniformly. So 
We have our risers, we have our trim system, we have our speed system, we have our A's, B's, C's, D's, we have our brake lines, our pulleys. Those lines connect to the risers through mallions, go up, cascade to their corresponding part on the wing. We have these inner cells right here. We have what we call battens right there. Now we're gonna talk about the harness itself. So here we have a harness, and although this harness is designed for free flight, almost like you do with a speed wing going downhill, we can also use this for ground handling and kiting. And it's also really the same concept that we have on our paramotors. We have two shoulder straps that you see right here. We have two leg straps. This is actually called a split leg harness. We have two leg straps. This is our right leg strap, or excuse me, this is our left leg strap. This is our right leg strap. We have a waist strap right here. In this case, we have a buckle, which is going to connect to this little T buckle right there. We have a chest strap right here. And then we have two carabiners right there. And these carabiners are what's going to attach to the bottom of our risers and allow us to actually clip into the wing. So whenever we put on our harness, we're always gonna put the shoulder straps on first and then build ourselves from the ground up so we make sure that we don't miss anything. We do it the exact same time each time that we do it. So I'm gonna start by putting on these shoulder straps. Can I, I can kind of adjust them a little bit just like I would with the backpack, make sure I'm comfortable. Then I'm going to start with my right leg strap. In this case, you can see that this buckle it's basically going to slide inside of itself just like that. And I can check it. And then I'm going to go to my left leg strap, slide it through itself just like that. And on some harnesses, you have a buckle that goes directly across for the waist strap. And on some, you have this little T buckle right there. So we're going to buckle that in right there. Check it, make sure that we're good. Move up to our chest strap right there. And then finally, if I need to adjust it, I can pull these shoulder straps a little bit tighter or loosen them just like so. I'm a little bit bigger guy, so I'm gonna like this harness to be a little bit, uh, have a little bit more room in it. We're then gonna put on our helmet. We highly suggest using a helmet in any situation when wind is present, especially when you're beginning. So I'm gonna put this helmet on, buckle the chin strap, and now that I have everything on, I'm gonna check everything from the bottom up. Starting with my left leg strap, right leg strap, waist strap, chest strap, and now my chin strap. We're back here at our facility. This is a municipal airport, municipal airport, which means it's a city-owned airport that is paid for by the city, owned by the city, uh, and re receives federal funds, which means that unless the FAA has done a study to disallow flex-wing aircraft, we are legally allowed to operate flex-wing ultralight vehicles or any aeronautical vehicle here at the airport. You can do more research on that using the FARs uh, or go to FAA.gov. But what's really cool about using an airport is that people expect you to be flying. They also have lots and lots of open space for you. As you guys can see here, the infields of the, between the taxiway and the runway are massive, and we utilize these for teaching all the time. There are still obstructions. We have trees, we have containers, we have more trees, AWOS antennas, that sort of thing, but they're minimal. The most dangerous thing we have generally while kiting is being drug across a taxiway. So when you're out there looking for things, keep these ideas in mind, whether it's a park, a city center, a playground, etc. There's lots of great areas to kite. All right, let's check out another location. Let's take a look around a few of the things on the field that could get us in trouble. The first thing, of course, is our light poles. We have big light poles right there, and those you can run into really easily. We also have trees, we have bushes, we have some signs. All of these items are things that we keep in mind. Now, there's one other piece that you may not think of right off the top of your head, and this is one I want you to walk away from for sure. It sounds crass, but the first rule of our school is don't be a dick. Act courteously, fly courteously. Right here you see that beautiful walking trail right there that goes right around our lovely hometown lake. And let's say it's sunset on a Saturday, you're out kiting, you're off work, 
there's also going to be hundreds of people walking down that walking trail. And one thing that we worked really hard to do when we used to kite here full time before we moved to the airport is we always worked to make sure that we did not impose or cause any fear in people walking down the trail because people might not be super stoked about the fact you have a giant kite that's pulling you around. So be very cautious with that as well and only kite here in conditions that would be safe and allow you to make your decision. So with that said, we're looking at the trees, we're looking at the light posts, we're looking at the water. We're aware of all these different items. I want to walk you through one more piece before we go on to our next location. That is called mechanical turbulence. Mechanical turbulence is what is caused by the wind hitting an object and then rolling around it. It's like dropping a rock in a stream. When you drop a rock in the stream, you get a little bit of white water in front of it and a whole lot of white water behind it. That's the, the water that would be moving smoothly is now being disturbed. What happens when you kite behind mechanical turbulence is that the wing will suddenly start to collapse and go all over the place because it's not getting clean, smooth air. So we wanna make sure that wherever we kite, we have plenty of room to have clean air coming to us. We wanna make sure we're not kiting the wind shadow or the mechanical turbulence of an object. And finally, we want to make sure that wherever we're kiting out here, while we've looked in front of us and seen all the things that are in front to hit, we also wanna make sure that there's nothing behind us to be drug into. If it's low wind kiting, we're gonna lay out here on the far edge with this right next to the road running as far forward as possible. If it's high wind, we're gonna be laying out right beside the lake so that we have plenty of room to get pulled back as that wing's inflating and coming through the power band. If you lay out right in front of that oak tree and you inflate the wing right now with the wind that we have, chances are very high you're gonna go into that oak tree or you can be drug into all of these oncoming cars or the power lines, the power poles. There's lots of bad things downwind of us. So always be keeping in your mind that you wanna have as much space as possible and you wanna have as few obstructions as possible. All right, guys, our next location, as you can see, it does say Aviator Paramotor, but that's because his son plays Little League. And we sponsor the team. We do, and it's one of the cool things we get to do because of guys like you who help us on projects like this, uh, we get to give back to the community, so thank you. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through this while Travis flies the drone, and right. here we go. All right, so first things first, Little League Field. It seems like the perfect place to kite just off the top of your head, but I wanna walk you through a few of the obstructions, the things to keep in mind as you are considering any baseball field, football field, etc. You'll see it from the drone. First off, obvious statements. We've got a scoreboard. We have trees, we have fences, all things you can easily be drug into. Now, if we pan over here, we also have some other things you probably don't want to be involved in. We've got lots of rotor producing or mechanical turbulence producing objects that wind will be hitting. Let's say the wind's coming the direction it is right now, which is basically just over these trees and over this giant cage, over all this nastiness. We'll see from the drone here in just a moment just how much there is that could get in your way. So when you're coming out to a site like this, even though it may be the best thing in your area, be aware of all the different things that might get in your way. And and even more importantly, going back to our very first rule of our school, be aware of the things that you could do that would scare someone or put someone in a dangerous position by being downwind of you. So looking around, we have all sorts of great area here to kite, but there's so many obstructions that it really is probably not ideally suited except for low, low wind kiting because you don't want to be drug into bleachers. You don't want to be drug into a whole bunch of little league kids. You want to be as wise as possible and do as many good and careful things as you can. All right, so location number three. This is one of our favorite places to kite for many years. This is a little municipal soccer par park or soccer field park. Uh, it's lakeside again. And the reason we brought you here, it's all on the same lake, but we brought you here because I want you to get something in your head. That is that this location, while it's pretty much ideal, it only has two major obstructions, plus some trees down there. Uh, it's terrible for today, and here's why. The wind is actually coming from right over here. Now, if you look right over here, you'll notice there's a big tree line, and we're also in a basin. We're in the middle of a basin where this lake resides. So there's hills, there are trees, there's all sorts of nasty turbulence that's coming over that hill right now that would make kiting here almost impossible. If it was your only choice and it was low enough wind, even with this wind direction, you could lay out right here by the lake charging toward the hill and maybe get away with it. But chances are, it's not gonna be an ideal situation because the wind direction is wrong and the wind speed is too high. It's good to know what you're looking at. It's good to be able to look around and say, this is a great site because if the wind were coming the opposite direction, it's pretty much flawless. All right, so where we stand right now is a field that we used to train in. In fact, all the fields you've seen so far with the exception of the baseball fields are fields that we have done kiting or flying training in. Now, uh, this one was actually a flying training field. This is about seven acres that you see behind me here. And it's a unique place. It was a parking lot for a passion play many years ago. And so it has this kind of divot and as you can see, all of the hills around it 
everything around it goes up, which made this a really challenging place to fly. It was extraordinarily challenging. Not only that, but here in Florida, we get what we call valley fog. So in the mornings, it would be beautiful everywhere except for this hole. So it was really a challenge. We're very thankful for where we are now at the airport, and thank you, City of Lake Wales. Um, but as a kiting site, as someone like you could find this in low wind. Now in high wind, you'll get that mechanical turbulence or rotor coming over the hillside, right? You'll have mechanical turbulence in the trees, from the tractor trailers. But other than those things, in low wind, think about this site. It's decent grass. It is all wide open. There's very few obstructions. If you're in low wind or no wind, this is exactly the kind of place you want to look for. This is the kind of place that will really help you along your way. You're looking for a big open field where you're not causing any harm to other people. You're not going to cause anyone to freak out. All you're doing is flying your kite. And we got property owner permission to fly here and to kite here for a very long time. And we had a great time doing it. So another great solution. And this one's out in the middle of nowhere. So you're really not bothering anyone. Alright guys, one of the most important considerations in keeping yourselves safe and trying to learn how to kite a glider on your own is weather. Really site selection is one and weather is the other most important one. Now there's going to be lots of days where you go outside and without really doing any forecasting it may seem like a beautiful day. But it's really, really important to do some forecasting ahead of time to make sure that you're not going to be out there with that glider over your head and have a sudden unexpected change that either drags you or lifts you up off the ground. Well, and it's actually really important to mention because as Travis said, this stuff really matters. You know, it, forecasting can make the difference between life and death. And we hate that we have to keep going back to the safety speech, but it's so imperative to realize that if you don't have a clear idea of what's coming down the pike weather-wise, you can get in big trouble really, really fast. So what yeah. are some of the best tools? Well, there's a, there's a couple tools first. There's going to be two things that you're going to do. One is going to be doing some online forecasting before you get out to the field. And then the second thing is going to be a site assessment, right. uh, basically a sixth sense assessment once you get out on the field. So we're going to talk about those two things. I'll discuss the online stuff first. There's a couple things that we highly re recommend that you use. One is called uh, Windy TV or windalert.com. Either one of those sites uh, you can go to before you get out to the field and uh, you can look up your local site and it's going to tell you what the winds are expected to be during the period where, where you plan to go kiting and also more importantly what the gust factor is going to be. When you're out there with a glider and, and we teach this during our full training uh, program, the gust factor plays a much bigger role in what that air is going to feel like than the actual steady state wind. Yeah, steady state wind is fun. You can play in high, high winds. We've kited over 20 miles an hour. In fact, the first day we were filming this, we were kiting over 20 mile an hour winds. But yes. When it's gusty, it's scary. It's not, it's, mm -hmm. You don't want to be connected to the glider. You don't even want to be hanging on to it. I mean, if you look at a forecast and it says that the expected winds that day are 5 miles per hour, which sounds like almost nothing, not a big right. deal, but gusting to 20 miles per hour, that's definitely not a day you want to go out and kite. Now, you may walk outside and you've got the 5, but you don't want to be clipped into that glider when you get that gust to 20 because you're going to go up in the air or you're going to get dragged. It's actually it's worth mentioning. So for us, our baseline that we're looking at is you don't want to be kiting any wind factor, gust factor that's more than between five and six. You can do it more, but as a beginner, you want to be kiting up to 10 miles an hour steady state wind and no more gust factor than 10 miles an hour either. So let's say it's two gust 10, it's going to be rough, but you can kite, uh, or three gust 10. Let's say it's one gust 10, you don't want to be kiting. Not That's at all. Not unstable, at all. nasty air. It's going to feel terrible. Yes, and, and we mentioned earlier, but anytime those winds are either uh, expected to gust over eight or be steady state over eight, wear a helmet, have a friend out there ready to help you disable that glider because things can go wrong at any time. And especially be sure that you're not at a site that has lots of rotor or mechanical turbulence areas that are, you're going to have guaranteed bad air because that air is already going to be challenging enough for you as a beginner. But additional to all that is, a, is something that Travis mentioned earlier, which is gut factor. When you go outside and you feel the air, there's something in the air. Our students oftentimes laugh at us because we'll walk outside and be like, guys, we're, we're not flying tonight. And they're like, but it, it looks good and the winds are below 10 and it, it's going to be fine. And I was like, well, give it 25, 30 minutes. We'll, we'll see how it goes. And sometimes it might be 15 minutes. Sometimes it might be an hour. But and there's a hits. gust front comes through that's 35, 40 miles an hour. You can feel that air happen before it comes to you because it's it's all pressure changes, right? You can feel that it in your is. bones. It is. And when you look at a forecast too, you know, you might look at a forecast and it says at 8 o'clock in the morning it's going to be 5 gust 7. At right. 9 o'clock in the morning it's going to be 12 gust 20. Right. So you don't look at that forecast and go, okay, I'm, I'm okay because I'll be good till 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock it's going to turn on. As long as I put that wing down at 8.59, I'm good. If you I see wish. that, if you see that in the <laughs> forecast, you should 
should be really leery of going out there yeah. even at eight o'clock because that means something's going on. Usually it's a high upper level wind that's going to, a uh, layer of air that's going to break, mix in, and when it does turn on, it's going to turn on unexpectedly and fast. And that's the thing we're always thinking about. We're not only thinking about the decisions we make, you know, on the ground with the glider, but also thinking about the greater, the greater picture there. What, what else is happening around this? And that's where these apps like Windy.tv help so much because they help you get a, a glimpse of the different layers of air. You can look at it via altitude. It also shows you a timeline by altitude. So you can look at the ground. And oftentimes we'll have what we call an inversion layer where the air is warmer at different altitudes and mm -hmm. eventually it breaks through when the ground temperature hits. And then we get these massive gust fronts at sometimes 8.30 in the morning. So it's something to yeah. be aware of and it's in your area. We don't live where you live most likely. So be aware of your local air, air and start watching this stuff. It's really cool how yeah. becoming yeah. a pilot, you start like being aware of everything that's happening around you. I love yeah. that. Yeah, that really is one of the neatest things. It, it, it's gonna change the way that you look at the sky, which will help you develop that sixth sense and understand how the weather works. Uh, the other thing that we should really talk about, that it just add, when you get out to that field, we talked about you know, that site, site assessment. You know, what does the sky look like? Um, look at the clouds. If, if you see Virga, Virga is when you see it looks like the bottom of a cloud has kind of been ripped down by a comb is a way I like to describe it. It's, it's usually yeah. a shaft of, uh, a downdraft of air. And often you see this, um, you know, in clouds that are going to eventually be rain clouds right. or, or perhaps even more um, significant is a thunderstorm cloud. And a, a, a small cumulus cloud can go from something that looks uh, benign to a thunderstorm in as little as 15 minutes. Which is terrifying. Which is <laughs> absolutely terrifying because these things create these gust fronts and these gust fronts can make the wind change from, from two to 60 miles per hour yeah. in no time at all. So when you're out there at the field, look around the sky. If you see dark, stormy looking things, things that look ugly, scary, Long lines, Virga, Virga, yeah, we yeah. call these uh, wall clouds or shelf clouds, anything that has shape, definition, darkness to it, probably don't kite that day. So after we've identified a suitable kiting location, we know what the winds are doing, we know what our upwind obstacles are doing, we know where they are, we know where our downwind obstacles and hazards are, we have a good suitable kiting location selected. We're then gonna take these risers and clip the riser loops through each other like that. I'm gonna grab both risers in the middle like so. I'm gonna get a coil of lines right here. I'm gonna collect them up. You can see that I have a a dominant hand and a non-dominant hand. I'm gonna collect all these lines up in what we call a rosette into my dominant hand, moving towards the wing. Now it's important that you move towards the wing because any time that you provide tension to this line, if wind is present, this wing, this glider is going to do what it's designed to do and try to inflate and take flight. So if we move towards the wing rather than pulling the wing towards us, we're gonna remove the tendency for that wing to want to inflate itself. So we're gonna collect all these lines into our hand, just like so, into a nice and easy to carry rosette. And then we can throw this glider over our shoulder, just like so, and walk to our kiting field and uh, get ready to set it up. So we're gonna imagine that I am looking downwind right now. The wind is to my back. I'm basically gonna to toss out this glider just like I would with a casting net, leaving that leading up edge up as much as I can get it right there. And then I'm going to take these lines, put them down like that, put my risers to the outside. Now, at this point, I could lay out my glider using one of two means. I can go and I can manually spread it open on the ground, just like so. Or I could use a method that we call hand kiting. And in hand kiting, I'm basically going to take these two front A's, which go to the centermost portion of the leading edge. I'm going to reach over with my left hand, just like so, controlling these brakes, controlling this trailing edge with my left hand. Now with my right hand, I'd be able to reach back Gently inflate this wing, providing those lines tension, letting that glider inflate, letting it climb up and fill with air. As I'm doing that, I can start checking my leading edge, start checking my trailing edge, making sure there aren't any gashes, tears, no damage to the wing surfaces. 
I'm also going to be checking the lines, making sure that they aren't, uh, nothing's tangled up, there are no line overs, there's no damage. If the lines were damaged, you'd be able to see that white inner Kevlar core showing through. So I'm gonna check that. I'm making sure that all those lines are going back to my carabiners like so, and my carabiners are closed and locked, or excuse me, my mallions are closed and locked. And I can do that, and as I'm controlling this wing, I'm basically using it like a steering wheel. I could then bring it back down to the ground and do what we call building a wall. So that's one way of laying out your wing. We obviously don't have any wind present in here. So we're just gonna hit the I believe button because I don't really have enough room right now to spread out this wing. But we'd spread out this wing nice and open. And then we'd make sure that I have both of my risers on the correct sides. After I've laid out my glider and I've checked everything over and I know that my risers are on the correct side and all my lines are clear, nothing's damaged, I'm then going to provide slack to these lines because I don't want to inadvertently inflate my wing if any wind is present. And I'm going to rotate these risers over themselves to the outside just like so. And I'm going to set the A's to the outside just like that. You can see how the leading edge of this riser is to the outside, the trailing edge of the riser is to the inside, leading edge of the riser is to the outside, A's are to the outside, trailing edge of the riser is to the inside, and these are both centered on the wing. This is going to make it a lot easier for you to get into the wing and clip in the same way every time. So for our forward inflation, we're going to reach underneath this right riser, almost like we're giving it a handshake. So we're gonna reach out, reach underneath, about halfway on the glider, and pull it up just like that. Now you can see that my leading edge is on top, my trailing edge is on the bottom. This is exactly the way we're gonna clip it into our carabiner. So I'm basically gonna rotate it, I'm gonna flip it over just like that, come down, and clip in just like that. We can remember this process by the, by the phrase, check it, flip it, clip it. We're gonna to check to make sure that that leading edge is up, that those A's are up, and we can also look back to the wing and make sure that those lines are going clear back to the wing and they're not tangled up and we have those A's on top. We're gonna to rotate it over and flip it, and then we're gonna clip it in. Now, if you get confused, you can just imagine this riser in flight, just like so. It's attached into the carabiner, just like that. These, this leading edge of the, uh, of the riser is forward, these A's are forward, and the trailing edge is back there, just like that. So you can see that when we ease it down, just like so, this leading edge of the riser is to our thigh, and the trailing edge of the, tr of the riser is to the outside, just like that. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing to the other side. I'm gonna reach underneath, just like I'm giving it a handshake. The A's are on top, just like so. I'm gonna check it, flip it, and then clip it, just like so. And the other thing that you saw is I didn't aggressively flip it over. If we aggressively flip it over, more than likely, these brake lines are gonna shoot off these little magnets and go through all of our lines, and then that's one more thing that we have to untangle. So when we flip it, we're just gently gonna rotate it over and make sure that we're clipped in appropriately. So, now that I'm clipped into my risers, we're going to do a process that's called door road brake. That's the next thing that we're going to check. So we're gonna start with these carabiners right here, and I'm number one gonna make sure that my riser is attached all the way onto the carabiner like so. This is a bad situation that you don't wanna be in right here, and the good news is that it's completely preventable. So we're gonna make sure that that riser is all the way onto the carabiner, and that both of these carabiner doors are closed and locked, just like so. So that's our first step, door. The next thing we're gonna check is our road, starting with these trimmers right here. We're gonna make sure that they're both set for the recommended takeoff setting, and a low wind, or a, a, uh, a no wind situation. We're gonna want these set about right here in the middle of this wing right here, or the middle of this trim range right there. Maybe in a higher wind situation, we'd be able to bring the trims out a little bit like so. For right now, we're just gonna make sure that they're set 
in the middle for the recommended takeoff setting and that they're both symmetrical with each other, just like that. So we've checked our trims. We're then going to move down and we're gonna make sure our streets are straight. Okay, so if our streets weren't straight and they were looped through each other, it would look something like that. Okay, so we want this. We don't want this. We're gonna make sure our streets are straight. So I'll undo that here. Our streets are nice and straight, just like so. And as we're checking this, we're also checking to make sure that this leading edge is to the inside facing our thigh and the trailing edge is to the outside facing away from us, just like that. So I've checked to make sure my streets are straight and my leading edge is towards my thigh. I'm also gonna check the stitching, make sure that everything's good. I'm then going to reach down, grab my left brake, grab my right brake like so. I'm basically gonna form a triangle in between the lower surface of my arm, my body, and my brake line right there. As I do so, I can look down at this brake pulley and make sure that the brake line goes directly clear to the pulley. If it weren't clear to the pulley, it would look something like this, okay? So you can see that our brake line is not clear to the pulley right there. Now, if this brake line is clear to the pulley, there's really no way, it's a closed system, there's really no way for it to get tangled past the pulley, okay? So, once again, we're going to check our door, we're gonna check our road, Make sure our streets are straight, our A's are to the inside, trailing edges to the outside. Brake, brake, clear to pulley, clear to pulley. Just like so. Now we're ready to reach down and grab our A's. So the first thing we're gonna do with our brakes in our hand is form like little finger guns, like pew pew, okay? If we form these little finger guns with our brakes in our hands, we're going to reach underneath the risers and basically hook our thumbs through these front A's, just like so. Now we only want to grab the front A's because those are the A's that we want to tension first. These front A's correspond to the centermost portion of the glider. These rear A's right here, as you remember, correspond to the outermost portion of the leading edge of the glider. So we want to tension this, the centermost portion first, so that's the first part of the glider that's gonna receive that high pressure air and that's gonna feed it out to the wingtips next. So once again, we're gonna reach underneath both risers, hook our thumbs around both A's, just like so. We can then bring our hands together, kind of like we're praying. We got our finger guns right here. Bring those hands up, just like this, and then bring our hands up and back, just like so. Now bringing our hands up and back is going to allow us a nice smooth, steady, and uniform inflation. If we're pushing forward, we can allow that leading edge to advance more quickly than the rest of the wing and do what we call a front tuck. Basically that leading edge shoots so far in front of us or advances so far in front of the rest of the wing that it has nowhere else to go but fold over itself. So keeping our hands up and back as far as we can get them, just like so, kind of slightly below nipple level, is going to allow us to get that nice smooth inflation that we're looking for. We can also do that by sticking our chest out and imagining that we have a quarter in between our shoulder blades that we're trying to hold in place. You also see here that I'm just hooking my thumbs around these front A's. I'm not pinching them. By pinching them, we kind of have an urge to hold on to these A's longer than we have to. We also have more of a temptation to kind of reach forward and push those A's forward and do what we call a Superman, causing a front tuck. So I'm gonna leave these hands up and back, forcing my chest out, imagining that I'm squeezing a quarter in between my shoulder blade and leaving those hands out and back as far as I could get them. We're now ready for a forward inflation.
All right, so now that we've clipped in, we've done door, road, brake, we've checked everything, we've grabbed the brakes in both hands, we've reached underneath, grabbed our A's, we're just hooking our thumbs around those A's. The next thing that we're gonna do is find our center point. I'm gonna be joined here by my lovely assistant, Kyle. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> so the first thing that we're gonna do is find our center point. We're gonna look out at a point on the horizon and we're gonna gently walk forward just enough to feel the even tension on these A's. So as I walk forward just enough, I'm gonna go slowly, just feeling for the tension on those A's. And as soon as I feel those A's tension, I'm going to stop. Now, if I feel more tension on one A versus the other, so if Kyle gives me more tension on the right side, I'm going to move towards that side until the tension becomes even on both front A's. I've now found my center point. And if I feel more tension on the left side, I'm gonna to move towards that side until that tension evens, just like so. So we're gonna walk forward just enough to feel that tension and then move our bodies only enough to make sure that that tension is equalized between two front A's. And if you walk forward too much, one of two things can happen, or both things could happen. Number one, you could unintentionally inflate your glider by providing that glider tension, or you could disturb that nicely laid out wing that you had before. So I'm walking forward, feeling even tension on those A's, feel even tension on those A's, and I'm going to look down to make sure that I'm not stepping over any lines. I'm gonna take about two steps back, so now I have slack again in these lines. After I've found my center point, I know that I'm centered up on the wing, I'm gonna focus on keeping those hands out and back, just as we did before, keeping that chest out, and then I'm going to focus on a reference point directly out on the horizon. It could be anything like a tree, it could be a fence post, it could maybe be a distant water tower. Generally speaking, the more far away these reference points are, the better they're going to be. I'm gonna look out at that point on the horizon, take a deep breath, and relax. Remember that this is fun, okay? Walking forward to check my centers, so I'm gonna check my little bump angle here, no more than about two pounds of pressure. You really wanna minimize the amount of pressure you use because if you pull too hard, the nose can fold forward. I'll show you what that looks like. If I pull too hard as I walk forward, now as I walk back, that wing looks like garbage. So I wanna walk forward for the smallest little bump on both thumbs. If I feel it on one thumb first, like for instance, if I'm over here and I walk forward, I feel that bump, I'm gonna feel this left thumb first. I'm gonna to move toward that, center myself, feeling just the tiniest little bit of pressure, everything feels good. So I'm gonna relax, run towards that reference point on the horizon, and as I'm running forward, these lines are going to tension and inflate. I'm going to keep those hands out and back and resist the urge to push them forward. Keep them out and back, lead with your chest, and at this point, it's, it's natural and acceptable to lean forward as you're running through that surge. Now as that wing climbs up and goes about halfway up into position, it's going to feel like a big drag chute behind you trying to pull you back and resist your forward movement. So at this point, it's necessary to run through that resistance. Keep running, keep running, keep running, because it's very brief. And if we stop running or we slow down, that wing is going to sink back to the ground or it's gonna stay in about that halfway position which we call the power band. So you're gonna run forward, you're gonna feel that initial resistance, keep running through it. Run, 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 and it will be over in no time. That wing is going to come up, clear the power band, and rise into position overhead. Now at this point, it's going to feel natural to want to look up at the wing and see directly where it is. Resist that temptation. Looking up does a few things. Number one, it disturbs what we call the vestibular systems in your ears. And that's basically the ear canals that you have and all the little tubes that move back and forward in your ear and provide you sensory input. So by looking up, you're disturbing all of that, that vestibular system. You're getting false sensory inputs that tell you that you're moving left or you're moving right or you're moving back or you're moving forward. The other thing is you lose your, your situational and positional awareness on the horizon because it's all blue sky up there. Um, and you're also ruining your posture. You're also starting to lean way back and slow down as a result because you have this rigid spine in your neck. So you're gonna look back, 
focus on the wing, and then slow down. It's important to remember that speed is life, speed is control. The wing is designed to fly. It wants to fly as long as you give it that relative wind, as long as you give it that, that forward speed. If we don't give it that forward speed, it's not going to want to fly, and it's not going to have the internal pressure that allows us control. So we're running, we're running, we're running. We can look out at the left wing tip. We can look out at the right wing tip, and then we can look back to the horizon to really get that positional awareness and get really a lot of quick information on where that wing is located. So we can look left, we can look right, we can look back at the horizon. As that wing climbs into position overhead, we're going to release the A's just by simply letting go of them, and we're going to do what we call catching the surge next. So as that wing climbs up through the power band and rises into position, it's going to have all this forward inertia and all this forward momentum, and it's going to want to keep going past us. We aren't going to let it. We're going to check the surge just lightly with just enough brake pressure as necessary to stop it from overflying us. After that, we're going to keep running towards our reference point on the horizon. We can keep our scan going. If we feel that the wing is turning, we can select turn with it, dance with it, and select a new reference point on the horizon. Looking out at a reference point on the horizon will tell you information like whether you're drifting left. That means the wing is going left, or it tells you you're drifting right. It's telling you the wing is going right. Or you could feel your whole body turning to stay with the wing. That's telling you that the wind is shifting. The wing is always going to want to turn into the direction that it's getting the most air from. We take a deep breath. It sounds silly, but I promise it makes a difference. Then I'm going to roll my shoulders back and my elbows forward. That forces my arms into this back position so my hands aren't doing the work. My chest is, or my, my body is, but my arms and my hands are not. So elbows forward, shoulders back. Deep breath again. I've got my target in front of me. I'm going to move forward quickly, and the moment I feel tension, you're going to watch my head. It's going to pivot to the left. As my head pivots left, I'm going to watch the wingtip as it comes up, and I'll go through the rest of the steps of the launch with you. So, so take us along to talk. One more deep breath. Bring that heart rate down. Look forward. Pivot forward. Tension. Watch the wingtip. Move forward. Feel that tension. Keep moving. Wings moving right, so I'm sliding right with it. Release the A's as it comes all the way overhead. Double check my other wingtip. And now is where I'd commit to flight. This is where I'd add power, lean back, and I'd be gone. But you can see in this position, I'm adding a good bit of brake pressure. There's about three miles an hour of wind right now, so it's making it a little easier for me to bring the wing up. Adding that brake pressure is keeping the wing nice and solid. Now I'll add more brakes, keep my hands all the way down, turn underneath the risers, and kite the glider down as nicely and gently as possible. One thing you may notice as I can lower to the ground with the glider, I'm all, always moving forward toward it so it lands softly. I don't want a big hard boom. I want a nice gentle fluffy hit. There's a lot in common between the forward inflation and the reverse inflation. Our means of doing it just looks a little bit different. So where we normally do a forward inflation in zero wind or light wind conditions under about four to six miles an hour, we'll usually do a reverse inflation when the winds are about six miles an hour or higher. So though it looks a little bit more complex, and you'll see why here in a second, it's actually a lot easier launch. In a forward inflation, our legs are having to provide all of the forward speed. That glider is going to need about six miles an hour to fully inflate and come overhead and provide lift and provide control, and our legs have to provide all of that in a forward. In a reverse, if we have about six miles an hour of wind, we can bring the glider up into that six miles an hour of wind, keep it in place, turn underneath it, and basically levitate right off of the ground. So though it looks a little bit more complex, it's actually a lot easier means of taking off if you have the right conditions. So the first thing that we're going to do, just as we would in a forward, is clip ourselves in. You can see that I already have my A's to the outside right here, just as I would in a forward. I'm then going to reach underneath both risers with my right hand just like so. So I have both risers in my right hand. I can kind of use my left hand to bring those ends together like that. And you can see that I have my A's on top and I have my C's or my D's on bottom, that leading edges to the top, that trailing edges to the bottom, just like so. 
I'm then going to rotate these risers completely upside down counterclockwise. So I'm going to rotate it upside down counterclockwise just like so, and then clip and clip just like that. So where we had check it, flip it, clip it before, now we have check, rotate, clip, and clip. You're always going to clip the riser into the carabiner that it's closest to. So we clip the left into the left and the right into the right. Now you can see if I move back right here, I have a riser that's now on top of a riser that's below right there. And they both cross over each other and go back to their corresponding places on the wing. So you can see here that my left riser is higher than my right riser, just like so. And just like in a forward where we did door road brake, we're gonna check for the exact same thing right now. We're gonna to check to make sure that those carabiners are closed and that that riser loop is all the way on the carabiner. We're then gonna to check to make sure that our trims are set, our streets are straight. Uh, our streets are straight, just like so. And just as in a forward, you can see that that leading edge of the riser is inwards towards my thigh and that trailing edge of the riser is outwards away from my body. So I go door, road, brake, clear to pulley, brake, clear to pulley, just like so. I'm then going to basically push this high riser over the top of my low riser with my left hand, just like so. So I'm basically just gonna push it over the top, just like that, and then I'm going to reach over with my right hand, and I'm gonna grab both front A's, just like so. And I know that I grab both front A's, not only because I see that the lines are different, there are two lines on this front A and there's one A line on this rear A right there, but if I were to look down at the wing, I would see that these front A's are both going to the centermost portion of that leading edge. If I grabbed maybe a front A here, and a rear A right there, I would see that this line is going to the middle, but this line is going to the outside. I want the front A's that are in the middle, just like so. So, I have both front A's in my right hand. You can see that I'm basically just supporting them with my finger like that. I'm then going to bring my left hand next to my right hand. Now it's important that we're only using our right hand to support these front A's because we're usually gonna have a throttle in our left hand. So our right hand is going to be the one that's occupied with actually inflating this glider. We want to bring our left hand next to our right hand because we don't wanna add any opposite brake input unintentionally during the launch. If I inflate with this right hand, I might have my left hand way back here. I'm gonna be adding all of that left brake pressure on the wing. So I'm gonna bring that left hand up I'm then going to lock out my elbows, just like you see here. You can kind of imagine it like a golf swing. In a golf swing, you want to lock out your elbows just like so. We want to do the same thing right here because we don't want to pull that leading edge towards us. Pulling that leading edge towards us during the inflation is the exact same effect as pushing our A's forward during a forward inflation. So I'm going to lock out my elbows just like so. And now with my wing or my wind to or my back to the wind facing Kyle, I'm going to focus on just lifting this leading edge up into the air as I move backwards into the wind using my body to provide tension to these lines. And now we're going to do just like with the forward, we're going to do the door, road, brake, clear. So doors are locked. Go going. down the road, check your trimmers, trimmers are set. grab your brake handles, brake one handles at a time, clear to the pulley. Clear to the pulley, door is locked, trimmers are set, pulley's clear. All right, I'm going to let you explain All right. your so, aim method. What I like to do to make this really clean and clear for students is I'll take a step back to add a little bit of tension. Once I have that tension so I can see that the lines are starting to come up just a touch, I'm going to take the riser, the top riser, the one that's closest to me. You can see how one's on top, one's on the bottom, right? I'm going to take the one that's closest to me, and I'm basically going to push it over itself. So right now, if it was stacked straight, everything was clean, just like we clipped in, I'm going to roll it. So now you can see you have A's on top. One, 
and two A's on top. I know that's a little bit complicated, so I'll show it a, different, a couple different times, a couple different ways. But this gives us a nice, clean A pull. You got both A's. You can see there's nothing on top of them. A lot of times you'll see pilots grab the A's, and they'll grab the A's a lot like this. We have all this mess over the top, and it does not look nearly as good. So we really want to be clear that we have the A's in our hands, and it's done cleanly by pushing the top riser over the bottom riser, and then grabbing those two A's in your right hand, making sure they're even, and then hands together, not holding the riser. This left hand's just sitting here beside it, so we're not pulling any brake. The brake line's behind my right hand. I'm stabilized, and I'm ready to inflate. As I do that, the swing is going to inflate off of the ground. It's going to come off of the ground, and then it's going to climb into that power band just like it did in the Ford. Now, in stronger wind conditions, you might be dragged a little bit. You might be kind of like stumbling towards the wing. That's acceptable, but you want to limit it to the greatest extent possible for the same reasons that we don't want to slow down in the power band in a forward. Speed is life. Speed is control. By moving towards the wing in that power band, you're decreasing the tension on those lines. We want to increase the tension on those lines and let that wing climb through the power band. So we want to fight. We want to resist the urge to get pulled forward towards the wing as it climbs through the power band. That wing is now climbing up. It's rising above our heads. As it starts to rise into position, we can release those A's. And now we're controlling. We're going to check the surge, dampen the surge just like we did in a forward with even brake pressure on both hands. We're going to talk about basic control underneath the glider in both a forward mode and a reverse mode here momentarily. Tension moving back. Top riser, the riser closest to me, gets pushed across. One, two. All right, my hand, they're even. My second hand comes up to meet, but not hold. And now right here, I'm in position to, to launch, but I want to make one more change. That change is going to be taking a step left of center, which as you can see, tightens those left, the, the lines on that side. And then as I move back, it's nice and smooth inflation, bringing the glider overhead, releasing the A's once it's going high enough, high enough but adding control pressures and speed is necessary. So we're going to control the glider, moving our hands up and down like pistons, moving our body as much as necessary, using that nice balance of control, just like so. And then after the wing is reliably overhead and nice and stable and steady, we're going to take one big step back because at this point forward, we want to be keeping forward momentum. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, unclip to demonstrate this next part. And you guys can see that I'm going to set the A's to the outside like I always do. So we can picture right now that I'm controlling the wing, I'm looking up, and at this point it's acceptable to actually look up at the wing. Okay, so I'm controlling the wing, everything's nice and steady. I'm then going to take a big step back with my left foot, and from this point forward, I want to focus on all of my energy going directly back behind me. So I'm going to take that big step back, and now as I turn, I'm going to take my head from looking up, and I'm going to take my head, and I'm going to find a reference point on the horizon just as I did in a forward. From this point on, after I turn, we're forward kiting just like we did in a forward inflation. So I'm going to take a big step back, keep all that energy going back behind me. I'm going to turn underneath the wing. Now I'm identifying that reference point on the horizon, and I'm going to add slight, even brake pressure as necessary as I turn. It's basically going to look like this, because I'm going to want to prevent that wing from surging in front of me and gift wrapping me as I go into a forward. So I'm finding that point on the horizon. I'm adding slight, even brake pressure with both hands. And now I'm forward kiting, just like I was before. I can check my left wing tip. I can look back at my right wing tip. And now I'm looking at, back at the horizon, just as I was in a forward mode. Run, 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 run. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, in the beginning of this video, the very first thing, we saw Travis and I outside, and, and we touched on something important. And we want to take a few moments now to 
kind of put the fear of God into people, I guess? Yeah, just a bit. I mean, uh, kiting may seem like it's mainly a recreational or fun thing, like you're out there flying a kite, but the fact is, just kiting a wing can actually seriously hurt you or potentially kill you if you do not do it in the right conditions and at the right site. Yeah. We tried our best to help you as you've gotten started here, whether you bought the wing from us, you bought the wing from someone else. Our, our hope is that you're flying or kiting a wing in conditions that are safe, that are stable, just like we talked about in the weather class, yep. uh, that you're, you're kiting the wing in a location that is completely safe and stable, like we talked about in the locations class. Mm -hmm. um, but there's more to it than that. And we want to make sure that your eyes are open to what might happen to you. Uh, so first things first, what happens if they get drugged? Well, I think that there's a few of us here that can show you some scars from that happening to us before yep. in the past. And then the fact is that uh, at best, if you get drugged, you're going to have some um, serious abrasions. Yep. At, that's at best. At worst, you could get drugged into a hard object and uh, basically crack your skull open, which never ends well. So, No, generally, um, like brains leaking out, no good. Things no like that. Barbed wire fences generally don't, uh, don't make life easy, easier, or either, either easier, either. <laughs> as you're getting drug across <laughs> them. So we, these are things that we've seen or that we've heard of or we've yeah. had friends where th these types of things has happened to. And uh, so it's very important that you follow some basic safety precautions before you go out and do this on your own. So that said, uh, there are other things to watch out for, getting picked up and slammed, uh, losing control of the glider, being drugged to obstructions that we talked about. A lot of this can go into your weather planning and your location brief. But uh, with that said, we want to say that there are a few areas you can mitigate these risks that are outside the norm, the things that like might happen crazy. Like if you're not mm -hmm. watching the weather and a gust front comes up, you could be on a site that's big enough that if you do get drugged, you're not getting drugged into an obstacle. If you get picked up, you know to switch immediately to the brake lines or the brake toggles. You don't worry about getting spun. Right. We could have people doing this at the beach and the wind shifts direction. You get drug out into the ocean. Uh, and, and seriously, if that glider fills with water, it's thousands of pounds of, of yeah. weight and there's, there's not much you can do. There's not a whole lot that's going to go well for you. So if you are kiting near water, please wear flotation. I don't care if it's a personal flotation device or a power float like you use on a, on a paramotor. Do something like that to mitigate the risk as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Have friends there to help you. The reality is if you get dragged into water, even with friends, chances are that you're going under unless you have some sort of flotation. Uh, if you are going to kite in higher wind, set limits for yourself. For our school, what we say is anything over eight miles an hour, a student on a big wing on a standard size glider is going to need a helmet. Absolutely. On, on and, a, and probably a friend out there too, yeah, helping yep. them out. Somebody, them somebody there to disable that glider if you need help or you're getting drugged. Yeah, especially as beginners, because remember, you guys aren't going to be experts at this. You're not going to know everything right at first, so it's okay to rely on your friends, to rely on contacts, and go mm -hmm. to the biggest field in town, even if it's a, a little bit further drive, it's worth the effort. Uh, speed wings, up to, I'd say 13 to 15 is usually our, our limit. Yeah, 13 helmets. to 15, uh, but still then you've got to be careful. I, I've been lifted up and dropped on my head on a speed wing before with a, a big gust that came out of nowhere. Where's the video of that? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep that one hidden. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very, very important though. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the stuff. The speed wings oftentimes will give you this false sense of security that nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to go wrong, but just because they're small doesn't mean that they aren't going to be lifty. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's... Well, and, and things that sometimes people don't think of, like uh, maybe the wind's only blowing 10 or 12 miles per hour, but you... You kite the glider over to between two obstacles or two buildings. Well, there's right. going to be a venturi effect between those buildings. So that 10 mile per hour wind uh, 100 yards away suddenly became 30 as you get between those two buildings and you find yourself being lifted 20 or 30 feet up into the air. That actually recently happened to one of our instructors mm -hmm. here and he, he made a pretty good crash landing on the taxiway and ended up skinning up his knees and his hands and his side. And, you know, the simple fact is that you can replace the clothing, you can replace the glider, but if you end up with hospital bills, it gets very expensive. But we want you guys to go into this with your eyes fully open, understanding that there are major, major risks and that this yeah. is not a, a real replacement for in-person training. This is something that will hopefully get your feet wet if you do it at the perfect conditions and the perfect timing. So And the perfect field. Exactly. Well. The perfect field. Exactly. Uh, so that said, also, uh, other things you should always, always use, and you've noticed in this video we have used them sometimes, sometimes we don't. That'll be a helmet that anytime it's windy, or even if it's not windy, that there might be a potential of wind building and you can stand the discomfort, wear a helmet. You're not an expert. You might as well protect your brain. And two is gloves. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see us always wearing gloves. If it's calm and, and kind of simple, we don't always wear them because we are yeah. expert level kiters. We've been kiting for years and years. But as a beginner, wear gloves, wear long sleeves. I, I have this scar you probably can't see on my arm that I got during my training where I was probably 50 feet up in the air looking down at the tops of palm trees, hanging on to one brake line upside down with my feet in the risers. Like, 
Mm. I got caught in a gust in a tiny field in a place I shouldn't have been kiting in the first place, but my instructor told me it was good. So that's why we're trying to avoid this pain for you guys. Um, wear, I would recommend high, high top shoes as well. When you first start out, you're going to want some support on your ankles. Uh, maybe you're kiting in a field that's not perfectly flat. Most of them aren't. We've okay. got uh, lots of critters out here that dig new holes in our field every night, even though it looks nice. It does look and, nice. Uh, <laughs> and you step into one of those, it's really nice to have some ankle support um, so you don't roll an ankle when you're doing this. If you're, if you're kiting, it's always best to kite in, in a, in a well-graded grass field if you have that. Now, those, those are always hard to find some, in some places, especially if you live in the southwest where you've got cactus and rocks and other things. If you're kiting somewhere where you don't have soft grass or a soft field, um, make sure you wear long pants, uh, yeah. maybe some sweatpants underneath it, something just to soften things up. Uh, you know, rocks or, or, or shale, things that are sharp, cactus, you know, all those things are, are things that you just want to try and avoid or not get dragged through or have some kind of protection. We know that you're, you're a beginner and you, you may not know all this stuff, but anything that you're body might be abraded across too. You probably don't want to have your wing on if you can help it. I mean, minimal time. So yeah, always, always be thinking ahead about what could be damaging your wing, what could be damaging your body, uh, watching out for poor, for poor conditions, and just really trying to make the best decisions you can possibly make. I mean, absolutely. you're a pilot. At the end of the day, these decisions you're making to kite, to pull a glider up, to connect yourself to a wing, those are your decisions to make. You make the final decision. And we hope that this has helped to prepare you somewhat, but understand that you're still the one making that decision, so we hope that you stay as safe as humanly possible. It's, it's imperative to us. The masters of ground handling are masters of maximizing their economy of motion and minimizing their input the, to the greatest extent possible to get that wing what they want it to do. Keep in mind that every input we give the glider, no matter how small, is going to disturb that airfoil and add drag to the wing. Therefore, we want to disturb it as little as possible. By its very nature, that glider wants to fly. That's what it's designed to do. Therefore, all we need to do is gently glide it. So to understand what kind of brake input and what kind of body movement we need to give that glider, we need to understand how it behaves in the air. So imagine that we have this glider line right here, and I'm not trying to hypnotize you, but we have this glider line here and we have a nut or a weight suspended at the end of this string here. We're the nuts at the end of the string. So you can see that we have some pendular motion going on here. We can view ourselves suspended from the glider in the air in much the same way. So if I were to stop moving my hand, this nut on the end of the string is eventually going to oscillate back into position without any movement from my hand. It's able to do that because of gravity. It's going to swing back into position naturally. Especially with beginner and intermediate wings, they're inherently stable. They have a natural tendency to return to their original position in space, largely without active pilot input. So, on the ground, our feet are planted on the earth. So we don't have the ability to swing underneath that, that glider. We aren't suspended in the air like we are on the ground. So because of that, if we come out to one side, we need to view ourselves as a pivot point instead of being suspended. So we're going to imagine that the glider is at the top of the string and I'm in a forward launch right now. I'm forward kiting facing you, the viewer. If I come out to the left, my wing is going to swing out to the right and that canopy is going to come over my head to the right like so. Our goal is to keep it above, directly above our head with as little input necessary. So to get that glider back under my head, I'm essentially going to move my body underneath the low side of the wing. Same concept applies if the glider were to come out to the other direction. I'm going to move my body underneath the low side of the wing to center that glider over my head. Now once again, speed is life, speed is control. If I have forward speed on the wing, whether it's due to my leg power in a forward, or whether it's due to the relative wind that's, that's provided to us in a reverse, I'll have the means for control. I can also add 
brake pressure to the high side of the wing. I can control that glider using brake pressure, using body movement, or using a balance of both. So, in a forward, if I'm facing you and this nut is going towards you, if this glider comes out to the right, I'm going to move my body to the right underneath the wing while pulling gentle and subtle pressure on that high side of the wing with my left hand. That left hand is going to pull the left brake, is going to add drag on the left side of the wing, which is going to pull that high side down. So the basic concept is move your body to the low side of the wing, pull down on the high side of the wing. The same concept applies in a reverse. The honest truth is that the wing doesn't know whether you're trying to control it in a forward or reverse. The only thing that changes is your perception of the wing. In a forward, obviously the wing is directly above us and our right hand goes out to our right side, goes directly to our right brake. Our left hand goes directly to our left brake, goes directly to the left side of the wing. In a reverse, we are now looking at the glider as it's facing us. The basic concept is still the same. We want to move underneath the low side of the glider while pulling down on the high side of the glider. So with the same concept, with the nut on the end of the string, if my glider is overhead and I'm facing it like so, and the glider starts to come down and to my left, that glider is actually coming down and to the right. So with my hands in front of my face, kind of like a fighter pose, almost in front of my body, depending on how long my arms are or how long my torso is, I'm going to move underneath the low side of the glider while pulling down on the high side of the glider. My left hand is still connected to the left side of the glider. My right hand is still controlling the right side of the glider. So if my glider comes down to the right side, I'm going to move right and I'm going to pull right to center that glider back overhead. All right, so a common misconception people have is that if you're kiting in an area that has obstacles, like that, you should do your best to stay away from them. So if you're kiting, and you're kiting along, and you start worrying about this light post that's behind you, and you're thinking, oh gosh, there it is, your body will start pulling away, but your brain will keep pushing the glider toward it, and because of that pendulum effect, if you move away from the post, where's the glider go? It goes toward it. So if you are afraid of this post, and you're getting pretty darn close to it, the first thing you want to do is say, stop, Eric, kite the glider. We're flying a wing here, we can handle this. It's just an obstruction. And the first move maneuver you should make is to move your body toward the object you want to move away from. Remember that our goal is to disturb the wing as little as possible while we're trying to dance with it and generally influence it to do what we want it to do. Because by that movement, that momentum of your body moving toward the object, it will make the wing turn away from it, and then you can follow your wing away. But the most important element here is you're not freaking out, you're not scared, you understand that this is all part of it. You have an object in front of you, you get to avoid it. No big deal. Relax, remember that this is fun, and don't frustrate yourself. If you need a break, take one. What we do is very exhausting, especially after, before you learn how to minimize your input and maximize your economy of motion by doing less. Remember that what we do is difficult and there isn't a single professional pilot out there or any professional ground handler who didn't initially struggle with these basic skills. Through perseverance and patience, you can and will pick up the skill and it is something that will become fun and even therapeutic to you. So here, John's gonna work hard to demonstrate some of the mistakes that might happen. He's gonna check a center point and he'll be purposely off by about two feet to his right. There you go. So you notice now that the lines on this left side are much tighter. He's gonna walk, watch his feet as he's walking backwards. <laughs> and now because the wing is not centered, because he's not centered with the wing, he's not that perfect nut at the bottom of the string, 
it's gonna come up really hard to the right and he's gonna have to try to keep up with it or choose to abort. One of the things that we hope to teach you at our school is how to abort safely. So let's move forward, arms are back, chest is out, watching the wingtip, wings moving right, look at his body move right, and he chooses abort. The wing came up really funny, let's turn around and fix it. Now there was enough wind here that he was able to abort and fix the wing and bring it back down nicely, but oftentimes you may find yourself springing to the side, just turn around and correct. And a failed launch or a successful practice launch is oftentimes a lot more exhausting than a successful launch because you're not doing it the way it was meant to be done. All right, so on today's fun challenge, we have Kyle Mooney, one of our instructors here at Aviator, and he's gonna be showing us exactly what it takes to go through an obstacle course with a glider. Now the purpose for this is learning how to better control your wing in tight, narrow situations, areas where it might be difficult to launch, where you have to turn the glider in order to, to have a safe area to, to take off. Let's go ahead, Kyle, let's launch that glider. As he brings the glider up, you'll see that he's got enough wind for a light reverse, not a whole lot of wind right now. He's gonna turn forward, and his first target is right in front of him, followed by a nice smooth right turn. Now what you'll notice that's kind of different is he's not actually gonna use a right turn initially. He'll move his body to the left, stepping left of the course to make the wing move right, and then he'll follow the wing. Because as we talked about before, the wing is your dance partner and you're the girl in the situation here. You want to let it lead you. So you'll initiate the turn by moving your body opposite and then follow it through the turn. And you'll do the same thing for the next two turns through the S's. Nice and steady, walking right by the first bottle, very nice. In a moment here, after the second bottle, you'll see him move left to initiate that wing, wing's movement to the right. I want you to also notice that his hands are down. He's adding about six inches of right, uh, both brake pressure so he can feel what the wing's doing. Here he's adding a little extra right hand, right past the first one, and we'll do a little steeper turn in just a moment. Very nice. A little bit more speed, let's build some speed. More speed gives us more control. So I can add a little bit of pressure to him, giving him a little more control to that wing. You'll notice that he has a little more firm control, a little more pressure on his hands. And now he's instigating the wing again. You notice in a moment, as he moves, he'll swing way left to correct for these next big right turn. He swings left, the wing starts moving right, his left hand comes up, right hand goes down, and right through these cones. This is a great project for yourself as you're learning to move your kiting from beginner level to intermediate, is to give yourself turning challenges. Areas like this that you have to go through an obstacle course to maintain or regain control. Close my eyes, take a deep breath. I know it sounds silly, but it makes such a difference. We wanna keep that in our heads, that calm over my shoulder. Got a point on the horizon I'm gonna to run toward. There's a tree out there that's got my name on it. I'm running right toward it. Elbows forward, chest out, run forward. Watch that wing tip as it comes up. Keep leaning forward, keep that pressure moving forward, more speed. The wing's moving left, I'm gonna move left with it. It's overhead, I'm releasing the A's. I'm moving my hands down to control position. And now I'm gonna add a little more speed, wing tip, wing tip forward, wing tip, wing tip forward. If you get to this position right here on day one, you should be very proud. This is a very good thing. It feels great. Keep that in mind and remember to let the wing lead you. So if that wing starts moving to the right, like right now it's moving right, I'm gonna slide my body to the right, still adding forward momentum so I keep my airspeed, but I'm gonna slide my body right more and more and more until it corrects. As it starts to correct, let's say it goes left. It's going left. I'm gonna move my body left. And I'm gonna bring my right hand down just to touch a small amount of brake, and then let the wing center overhead. <laughs> you want very minimal input. You wanna use as light hands as possible. You may see me pull about four to six inches, but I'm not moving much pressure. I'm keeping it balanced. The next element I wanna teach you is this. Let's say it's your first day on the field, or your 300th, and you're out there kiting, and everything feels pretty good, but then suddenly the wing gets kind of funky. Let's say it moves off to the right, and it's beyond the area that you could fix it. We're gonna turn underneath the glider and correct it in reverse as quickly as possible. So, we have the glider set and stable, turn back forward, charge back forward, get that forward momentum back. All right, Let's say we have a wingtip collapse. Wings collapse. I turn, I fix it immediately, and I stabilize that wing. So again, anytime things get funky, I turn back toward the glider so I can fly it properly. Once things are stabilized, I can turn back forward, get back to that balance position, have my posture, my power, and then my pressure to fly. 
So we've talked about the window. We've talked about where we want the wing to remain. We talked about the side to side motions where we're using our body, whether we're leaning or we're using brake input and moving side to side underneath to keep ourselves centered. Sometimes though, you'll notice the wing will start to sink down. And if that wing starts to sink, let's say that the wing is falling down right now, you can release the brake input, squat your body down and run backwards. That little scurry step backwards has a huge amount of work for you because it takes away most of the effort. So if the wing starts to sink, you squat down, release brake input and then catch the surge as it comes back overhead. Other things you could do as well is you could bring it down a bit lower and you can grab your A risers and pull those closer to your face. Those are right there in front of you and switch back to your brakes. So these A risers are great friends of yours once you have the experience requisite to be able to let go of the brakes and come right back to them. So lots of little things. Again, we see that surge, wings down low, he squats down, wing comes right back overhead. All right, so the next thing that we will oftentimes see happen as a beginner, you start inflating the glider or you're sitting here kiting, everything's great. And all of a sudden the wing starts to surge past you. That's where it basically outruns, it outruns these lines and you see that frontal collapse. Now here's what you want to do when you have a frontal. You want to make the wing fly again. So there's a couple different ways of doing it. The fastest way, if you have the right wing, you have the right conditions, is to very simply let the wing start to collapse, big brakes behind your back, and then release those brakes back up ahead to let the wing come back overhead again. With enough wind, it'll actually stay in the air the whole time, but You've added big brake pressure to get the nose reopened and then release the brake pressure to allow the wing to fly. Let's see it one more time. Big brake pressure and you've got to scurry back a little faster. That scurrying back will give you a little more speed. So as he gets right here at the edge, wing's going to start surging and scurry, 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 scurry. There you go. Right before collapse, he adds the brake pressure as necessary, scurries his body back to retention those lines, opening the nose. That was perfect. That's what we want to see. If we have a moment where we get that big surge, we want to find ourselves moving backwards to retention the lines, adding brake pressure to reopen the nose, and then get our hands back up to let the wing fly again. All right, guys, a lot of what we've talked about is how to keep yourself safe when things get crazy, when the wind picks up, etc. The obvious choice is to add brake, bring the wing back to the ground, but how can you do that without being drug across the field? There are some ways, and Travis is going to demonstrate the first one for you now. The first thing you can do is to bend your knees, build some speed, and have that wing overshoot you, and then immediately add big brake so the wing falls down, doing minimal pull through that power band. The power band being the area that drags you across the ground if it's stuck in it. That system right there works much better than adding big brake alone. Letting that surge happen allows you to stop the surge, bring the wing down much, much faster. The next element that you might have seen Travis do there is that he immediately added brake pressure. He kept those hands all the way back behind him and he started moving toward the glider. And especially high winds, it's best to have a friend there to, to stand behind the glider like I'm doing right now. You can stand right here and that glider can flap and float all around you, but it's not going to drag your buddy until he's able to get disconnected and keep himself safe. Additionally, if you are by yourself, you can start running to the side and try to catch one wing tip. It's a little more challenging. It does have some danger, but get to that glider as quickly as you can so that it can become a streamer rather than a wing. Another method of disabling the glider that's very, very solid and a great way to keep yourself safe is to reach up and to grab the B or C lines. Generally, I'll grab a B and a C and I'll grab those risers, reach my arms up the risers as high as I can and pull them across each other to disable the wing. This is not quite as good as the surge overhead because you lose control of your brakes, but it's still a great way of particularly an exceptionally high wind when you don't want to have it go through the power band at all. There's a B line right there. You can see how the whole wing right in the middle stalls and goes away. That's called a beeline stall. Very nice. In this situation though, if you were to continue holding those beelines, it can still flap, which is again why you might want to have a friend to help you out. So let's say it's time to bring the glider down. We're going to land the glider nice and soft, as soft as possible. You'll see more expert pilots grab the A's right before it touches to save it a little bit of extra tension. I'll show you that one more time. Wings coming up. We're in position. Really, really good pilots will gently grasp the A's just to keep the wing from coming down too quickly. Right as it starts to touch, they add a touch of A, and as you can see there, it makes it almost effortless and silent. Now the next piece, and this is really important, is you always, always want to stow your brakes. And a lot of people don't do this, so I'm going to stow the brakes ozone to ozone, or magnet to magnet. Now I have the risers in my hands. I'm going to walk forward, give myself some slack. And right here, this is important, I'm going to take the the first riser off. I'm going to reach out here and say, okay, A's are on top. The lines all look perfect. Walk forward, 
whip forward gently. You don't want to whip so hard the brake comes off, but walk forward, whip forward, and then roll the A's outside, just like we talked about earlier. Again, same thing on this side. I'm going to pull a little bit of tension, make sure everything's straight, everything's clean and clear. Walk forward, roll the A's outside, and drop the risers. This way I'm prepared. I'm ready to go fly again. There's not a moment that I'm going to have to spend checking to make sure the lines are all perfect. I can actually know that if I laid it out properly, I check the lines, I put the A's outside, unless the wing gets drug, I'm ready to fly. All right, so what we have now is the end of the day. Let's say it's still nice, calm winds, but you have to go to work, you have to go do something, your, your exercise for the day is done. It's only about three to four miles an hour right now, so I'm not gonna do a high wind rosette, but I'm gonna show you the basic way that we're gonna collect the glider to keep the glider in really good condition and to make it really easy to set back up again the next time you wanna fly. So first things first, we're gonna take the risers. I like to hold them right here underneath the speed bar links. We'll do the same thing on the other side, keeping the A's on top. I'll walk back and double check that my lines are still straight. Even though I just checked them a minute ago, I'm gonna double check everything's good. I'll bring these together. And now I'll switch so I have basically a little grip here between the ends of the risers. And I'll collect one arm at a time. I'll collect these long loops, bringing them back up here to my other hand where they can't get trapped by the riser. The other option is to hold above the uh, mallions. This is really up to personal preference. The goal being that you don't create any sort of a opportunity for these risers to go through the lines. So big loops up to my hand, big loops. Notice that I'm walking toward the glider. I'm not actually pulling the glider to me because that would make it inflate. So I'm walking toward the glider, making big loops, big loops, keep gathering the glider together. Now here's where most people stop as beginners. And this is a mistake. You want to go all the way down until you have a fair amount of glider in your hand itself. Now you notice that all of these lines now are beautiful. The center of the glider is all right here in front of my arm. I could put this hand if I wanted to, if I say I'm a little shorter guy, I could reach down here and grab a little more glider lines and get all that in my hand at once. And once that's in my hand, I'm gonna collect this over my shoulder with the wind behind me so that the wind is pushing the glider into me. That gives me a great opportunity because if I were to do this and have it out in front, I could look like Mary Poppins. See a gust of wind catches me, now the wing, wing's full of air. Right here over my shoulder and marching back to the hangar. And now you can see that I have a nice open glider bag right here. So I'm gonna take this glider and plop it down right on top of the bag, just like so. I'm gonna put those coil, that, the, that coil of lines directly down in the middle of the glider. I'm then going to take my connected risers pull them outside of this packed up glider. And I'm gonna basically put those lines in between the intersection of those two wingtips. The next thing I'm gonna do is come around and I'm gonna start collecting up all these cells. Now the reason this is important is because you're gonna to try to protect these plastic battens from becoming compressed or bent um, when, you, when you pack this wing up, which is going to add lifetime to this wing. When these battens are packed up together, they provide each other strength and integrity. So we're gonna pack them up just like so. And you can really start at any point on the wing. You can start at a wingtip and work your way to the other wingtip. You can start in the middle of the wing tip or wing and gather up both wingtips, really what's ever easiest for you. You can even grab like three cells at a time, just like so. Most important thing is that you're collecting up all the wingtips. So I have all the cells right now in my right hand, just like so. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna karate chop this wing and fold these cells over themselves just like that. So now all of these cells are gonna be inside of the middle of this wing. I'm then gonna take these wing tips, packing them around the battens, and you can see that I'm squeezing the air out that allows it in a, in a direction that allows it to basically squeeze out of that leading edge. So this is where I thank the wing for all the safety and enjoyment that it provides me. Slowly and gently squeezing that air out, continuing to pack those wing tips around the wing. Gently squeezing the air out. Almost 
there. So there we go. Pretty much all the air out there. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab these risers. I'm gonna pass them over the wing, just like so, and then roll them underneath the wing, just like that. So they cross over the top and then go underneath. Next thing I'm gonna do is take this bag, put it over the top, just like that. I'm gonna buckle it across. I'm going to take these two buckles, basically make an X with them. Just like so. And then take these big two buckles at the end right here and buckle that across just like so. Now you'll see that my risers are right here. We cross them over the glider, put them underneath the glider. Now they're packed away. And there's no way for them to fall out because we crossed these uh, clips right here. There's no way for them to fall out of the bag and now scrape across the ground as we're walking off to our kiting site. And there's no way for them to become tangled inside of the bag either. So that's it. That is your airplane in a bag. All right, guys, we've given you a lot of information in this yeah. video over the last uh, couple hours. Uh, we'd like to thank you for making your way through it. Um, our expectation is that you guys are going to be able to watch this video several times and get out there and practice those skills and those techniques that we've attempted to communicate to you before they're really going to sink in. You're going to have to watch, practice, watch, practice, and that's how you're going to get the best effect from using this video along with the glider that you've got at home to practice these skills. Yeah. Now that said though, uh, we want to offer you guys an opportunity as well. There's two things. First, there's a Facebook page called Aviator PPG or Aviator Paramotor on Facebook right now. While you're kiting, get a family member to go out and film you, take your picture. We have a full staff and a whole bunch of students who I'm sure would be happy to offer you some advice, kind of help you out along your way. Additionally, we want to remind you that this is not an end-all be-all. This is just an introduction to how to kite. There's some great resources out there for advanced kiting. And we'd love to see you join either us, ourselves, or one of our alliance partners to learn how to fly. That is absolutely paramount. If you don't have full training, you are only just barely scratching the surface. This should be your first step, mm -hmm. not the end of the road for you. While kiting is amazing, once you're actually in the air, flying around, literally, it's, it's something that you can't even put into words. It's such an incredible experience. So please, take the time to contact us. Find us on Facebook. Take some time to be a part of our family, whether it's on YouTube, on Facebook, anywhere else. We'd love to help you along your journey of kiting, but we're really passionate about helping you get in the air on your own, just like we do every day. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, as, as you mentioned, this is only the beginning. Tight, uh, this kiting and ground handling is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to this sport, but if you can conquer this, if you can develop some of these skills, you are gonna be so far ahead of the game when you actually get to your instructor and start your paramotor training. It Absolutely. It's gonna help you out so much. Uh, we, we just wanna say that we're very honored that you guys have taken the time to watch this. Indeed. Uh, and it really means a lot to us, and we'd like you to contact us, like you've already mentioned, and give us your feedback. If there's something else that we can do with this, some more information that we can get out there, or changes to this video that we can make to make this a better product for you. We love feedback. We love to always improve. And, always. And uh, please give us a call. Yeah, anytime. absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for watching. It's been an honor, truly. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Cool. High good? five. We're good. And we're done! <laughs>